Kansas is no stranger to severe weather. The state's location in the middle of North America's Tornado Alley makes it a state especially prone to such disasters. When the spring and summer months roll around, the state's seasoned residents know what signs to look out for when severe weather is on the horizon. The hot, humid air, the bright blue skies. All of these signs were there on April 26th, 1991. Early morning atmospheric observations from Norman, Oklahoma showed ample amounts of moisture and instability draped across the region. Coinciding with these moist and unstable conditions was a swath of intense wind shear, created by a jet streak situated over much of the Great Plains. On top of this, a dry line had also developed in central Kansas, providing a source of lift to get storms going. Everything was in place for a significant tornado outbreak, and the National Weather Service knew it. At 12.10 p.m., a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch was issued for central and eastern Kansas, including the city of Wichita, the largest city in the state. This setup was not surprising to most, however. The day prior, the Storm Prediction Center had shared their concern regarding the upcoming severe weather on the 26th, stating that the various weather models utilized by the agency were indicating this to be a very significant severe weather producer, with tornadoes occurring across the central southern plains. With this information in mind, the Storm Prediction Center issued a rare high risk for much of the Great Plains during the early morning hours of April 26th. Local meteorologists across the region quickly got to work distributing warning to people in their respective viewing markets, as they began to go on their daily routines. The bright blue Kansas skies were broken as the afternoon neared its end. Tall, violent supercell thunderstorms would initiate along the dry line, and quickly mature into formidable thunderheads. Large hail and damaging winds would rampage across the Kansas countryside, but it wasn't until shortly after 5 p.m. that these storms would begin producing tornadoes. At first, these twisters were weak. Brief and relatively harmless, they only damaged desolate Kansas farmland. These tornadoes wouldn't remain so harmless for long, though. At 5.49 p.m., another twister would touch down, this time near the town of Clearwater. Unlike the tornadoes before it, this one would not remain weak for very long. In mere minutes, it would grow to be a violent behemoth, with winds in excess of 200 miles per hour. This would prove to be the beginning of a historic tornado's rampage that would cause millions of dollars in damages and take the lives of 17 individuals, going down in the history books forever as one of the worst tornadoes in U.S. history. Yeah, I think it's coming straight this way. Heather, you get in there. I'll be there in a minute. The twister that would become the infamous Andover F5 was relatively slow to intensify, with only minimal damage occurring for the first several minutes of its life. The first tornado warning for the storm would be issued at 6.09 p.m., just as tornado sirens began to sound in the communities of Mulvane, Hayesville, and Derby. The National Weather Service would make sure to include wording within the warning specifying the danger of the situation, as spotter reports would continue to suggest that the storm was intensifying rapidly. At 6.20 p.m., the city of Hayesville would be the first to bear the impact of the tornado's fury. At this point in its life, the tornado was producing predominantly EF2 and EF3 damage as it tore apart suburban homes and tossed vehicles around like they were nothing. As all of this was happening, personnel and their families at McConnell Air Force Base watched in horror as the rapidly strengthening tornado inched closer by the second. On the property of the base stood several B-1B bombers, each worth over $280 million. Two of these bombers were carrying nuclear warheads. After crossing the Kansas Turnpike, those at McConnell Air Force Base were left helpless as the tornado tore directly through the southern sections of the runway, destroying several key facilities, including the base hospital, officers club, the library, and the base elementary school. Base personnel on site that day were able to catch the tornado on film, capturing what has since become one of the most iconic tornado videos of all time.
The tornado narrowly missed the line of B-1B bombers, though it is important to note that the likelihood of the tornado setting off the nuclear warheads within them would have been incredibly slim, and would have required a long list of very specific reactions to occur. 102 housing units inhabited by base personnel were destroyed, and the base as a whole was rendered all but incapacitated. In total, the tornado was responsible for $68 million in damage at McConnell alone. Thankfully, nobody on site was killed, though 16 injuries were documented. Upon exiting the base, the twister would tear through portions of suburban Wichita before crossing a US-54. At this point, the tornado was of violent intensity, having previously produced EF-4 damage as it impacted an area of homes to the west of McConnell Air Force Base. The city of Andover lay in the center of the tornado's path, and at 6.30 the National Weather Service had issued a tornado warning for the city. In spite of this, however, the tornado sirens in Andover had failed. Local police were forced to drive door to door announcing the incoming tornado over loudspeakers to warn residents of the approaching danger. By 6.43, the tornado had entered the city, where it quickly began shredding everything in its path. Numerous houses and businesses would instantly be reduced to concrete slabs in a matter of minutes. It was in these areas that the tornado produced F5 damage, where National Weather Service Survey has determined winds to be in excess of 260 miles per hour. The tornado was also at this intensity as it traversed through the city's Golden Spur Mobile Home Park. It was here that the largest law enforcement presence had been during the city's efforts to warn residents of the oncoming tornado after the failure of the local tornado sirens. Most residents had elected to evacuate, but a few dozen had made the choice to stay. 38 of the 339 residents who were at home that evening elected to stay, 13 of whom unfortunately lost their lives. 17 were left hospitalized and the rest sustained minor injuries. Of the 244 mobile homes in the park, 205 were destroyed, accounting for over 80% of all structures there. As a tornado moved through the city, similar levels of devastation were documented. Over 1,500 residences were destroyed. Just as soon as the tornado had arrived in the city, however, it had exited, as it raced off to the northeast. The twister would slowly weaken as it did so, but not before impacting portions of the town of Tawanda, where minimal damage would occur. A few minutes later, the Andover F5's reign of terror would come to an end, lifting near the Kansas Turnpike just beyond the shores of El Dorado Lake. However, the supercell that produced the twister was far from finished. At 7.15pm, another intense tornado would touch down to the northeast of El Dorado Lake, and like Andover before, it would quickly intensify. This tornado would parallel the Kansas Turnpike as it would slowly approach the town of Cassidy. As it traversed over predominantly Kansas countryside, the twister would be followed and filmed by a local Kansas television crew. As the crew tracked the twister, however, they would soon find themselves directly in its path. With no nearby shelters, they would resort to sheltering under an overpass. The core of the tornado would narrowly miss the overpass, but the camera crew and several other stranded motorists would survive it as the outer portions of the tornadic circulation would pass overhead. Video of this encounter would be aired across the nation, popularizing the false belief that overpasses provide good shelter from tornadoes, a belief that in the years since has cost many lives. Just eight years later, on May 3, 1999, fatalities under overpasses would occur at three different locations, including in Moore, Oklahoma, where an F-5 killed one person sheltering beneath one on I-44. Elsewhere, an F-2 also took the life of one person sheltering beneath an overpass, the same intensity as the tornado that narrowly missed the television crew on the Kansas Turnpike. 
Ever since then, meteorologists have made it a point to advise people to avoid sheltering beneath overpasses, citing several reasons as to why, including a wind tunnel effect produced by the shape of many overpasses and an increased risk of exposure to flying debris. As the day would come to an end, several other tornadoes would touch down around the Great Plains, including enough four that would terrorize rural areas near Red Rock, Oklahoma. Emergency declarations were quickly issued for several counties in both Kansas and Oklahoma, initiating the delivery of federal aid to numerous disaster-ridden cities. Recovery efforts would begin immediately following the disaster, as thousands from around the country would descend on Andover and other communities to help rebuild. Within a few years, buildings would be rebuilt, residents would return home to their communities, and memorials would be erected in honor of those who had lost their lives. The March 26, 1991 outbreak also marked a new era in the history of the National Weather Service. During and prior to the outbreak, the WSR-57 had been the most prominent radar model in use across the country. However, a new radar model, the WSR-88D, stationed in Norman, Oklahoma, was an experimental usage covering across much of Oklahoma and Kansas that evening. This radar provided excellent coverage of storms as far as 125 miles away, detecting the Andover mesocyclone even as local radars were unable to detect anything indicative of a tornado activity. NWS Wichita meteorologists were therefore forced to rely on storm spotter reports to give proper warning, hampering their ability to give advanced warning time to those in the path. Following event, the National Weather Service determined that it was essential that they continue to implement these new radars across the country a decision that has led to a drastic increase in lead time in subsequent years. All in all, the outbreak of April 26, 1991 would take the lives of 21 people, 17 of whom lost their lives in the end over F5. Nearly $600 million in damage would result from the outbreak, and the lives of thousands would be changed forever, marking the outbreak down in the history books as one of the most significant in American history. With that, thank you for watching. Feel free to leave a like or subscribe so our content reaches a greater audience. We're also interested in seeing what you have to say in the comments, whether it be any commentary you have regarding our video or stories about your own experiences with severe weather. In the meantime, stay safe, and see you next time.